If you're a fellow space nerd like me, perhaps you've heard terms like LEO, low Earth orbit, geostationary orbit, highly elliptical orbit, maybe even my personal favorite, near rectilinear halo orbit, and thought to yourself, what do these all mean? What's the difference? Well, in today's video, we're gonna unravel the mysteries of orbital mechanics in an easy to understand way, so that hopefully by the end, you'll have a pretty strong grasp on why and how things orbit the way they do. Anyway, let's dive straight in. Now starting with the basics, what is an orbit? An orbit is a regular repeating path that one object in space takes around another due to gravity. Now imagine throwing a ball horizontally. It eventually falls to the ground because of gravity. Now if you could throw the ball fast enough, it would keep falling towards the Earth but never hit the ground due to its horizontal velocity or speed. Now this is essentially what an orbit is. Satellites stay in orbit by balancing their forward motion with the pull of gravity creating a continuous free fall around the Earth. Now this is why, for instance, if you've ever watched an orbital rocket launch, you may have noticed shortly after the initial takeoff, the rocket trajectory starts to take a sidewards turn or fly slightly to the side of vertical. Now this is called a pitch over maneuver, which is essentially designed to align the rocket with its orbital trajectory. Because remember, space is up, but orbit is around, relatively speaking. Now, low Earth orbit, or LEO, ranges from about 160 to 2,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Now, this is where the International Space Station sits, completing a full orbit of the Earth approximately every 90 minutes. Now, LEO is ideal for Earth observation, weather monitoring, and communication satellites due to its close proximity, which allows for lower latency, or the time it takes for a signal to travel between the Earth and the spacecraft. Now it's also excellent for higher resolution imaging. Now, the closer you are, the easier it is to get good photos. Now Landsat satellites, which are operated by NASA and the US Geological Survey, also orbit in LEO at an altitude of approximately 705 kilometers. Now if you've used Google Earth before, this is where those images come from. Now this satellite network uses LEO to image the Earth approximately every 16 days. Starlink satellites are another example of spacecraft that use LEO, or low Earth orbit. Now, these satellites orbit at an approximate altitude of 550 kilometers. Now, as of a time of writing, there are well over 7,000 Starlink satellites currently in LEO. Now, as you might guess, satellites in LEO make up over 90% of the total man-made satellites currently in space. A medium Earth orbit, or MEO, spans from 2,000 to 35,786 kilometers above the Earth. Now this region of space is commonly used for navigational system satellites like GPS, GLONASS, or GLONASS, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, but it's essentially Russia's version of GPS, as well as Galileo, which is the ESA, or European Space Agency's version of GPS. Now why are GPS satellites placed into MEO and not LEO? Well, there's a few very good reasons for this. Now, the higher orbit of MEO means that far less satellites are required for global coverage. Now, most GPS satellites orbit at an approximate altitude of 20,200 kilometers. Now, at this altitude, one satellite can see around a third of the Earth's surface, meaning you can get a lot more done with a lot less satellites. Satellites in MEO also take 12 hours to complete one orbit, compared to just 90 minutes from a satellite in LEO. As the satellites in MEO take far longer to make their way around the Earth, this means that from an Earth perspective, they're traveling much slower over the surface, making them much easier and simpler for receivers to track. A higher orbit also means lower atmospheric drag, which increases the lifespan of the satellite. Yes, there is still atmosphere in space. It's extremely thin at LEO, but it is still there. Now this is why, for instance, the International Space Station, or the ISS, needs regular altitude top-up boosts to keep it from falling back to the Earth. The very small amount of drag provided by the incredibly thin atmosphere at 400 kilometers altitude is enough to, over time, slow the ISS down, reducing its orbital altitude. At 35,786 kilometers above the equator lies geostationary orbit. Now, 35,786 kilometers seems like a really oddly specific number, but there is a good reason for this. 
At this altitude, satellites in geostationary orbit travel around the Earth once every 24 hours, matching the Earth's rotation. Now this synchronization with the Earth's rotation allows them to essentially hover over the same spot, geostationary, meaning stationary against one geographical location. Now this makes geo, or geostationary orbit, ideal for weather forecasting, television broadcasting, and some communication services. Now, similar to MEO, satellites in GEO can cover around one third of the Earth's surface each, so you can do a lot of work with very few satellites. Now, different to MEO, objects in GEO start to experience a significant amount of latency, or the time it takes for the signal to travel from the Earth to the satellite and back. Now, this makes GEO inappropriate for many applications which require low latency, such as communication, internet, and GPS. Now, along with latency, one of the other major cons is the work required to get an object into GEO. Now, it takes 35 to 50% more energy to get an object into GEO compared to LEO. Now, for a rocket like Falcon 9, depending on the weight of the payload, this can make the difference between being able to recover the booster and using the booster in expendable mode, where there isn't enough fuel left over to recover the booster. Now, there's a bit more that goes into it than that, as for big payloads, Falcon Heavy can also be used, but we're not going to go any deeper into that on this video. Near Rectilinear Halo Orbit. This is my favourite orbit, for no other reason than it's just such a cool name. It rolls off the tongue so nicely. Now, venturing significantly further beyond the Earth to our Moon, we have the Near Rectilinear Halo Orbit, or NRHO. Now this pretty unique orbit is what NASA plans to use for its Lunar Gateway, the Lunar Space Station which will act like a orbital moon base for future Artemis missions. We're getting into some of the slightly more complex orbits here, so we're going to have to cover Apogee and Perigee to really understand what an NRHO orbit is. An NRHO is a type of highly elliptical orbit, which is essentially an oval shaped orbit. Now, the perigee of an Earth orbit is the lowest altitude point of an orbit, or the point at which the orbital object is the closest to the surface of the Earth. And the apogee is the opposite, the highest altitude point of the orbit, where the orbital object is the furthest away from the Earth. Now, highly elliptical orbits have a low perigee and a high apogee, or in basic terms, they have a stretched oval shape. An NRHO is a specific type of highly elliptical stable orbit around the Moon and the Earth-Moon L2 Lagrange point. Now, a Lagrange point is the point between two celestial bodies where the centrifugal forces experienced by an orbital object and the gravitational forces of the two objects balance out to a sort of equilibrium. In basic terms, it's sort of like a gravitational balance point. An NRHO loops tightly around the Moon's poles, swinging far out on one side and tucking very close in on the other. Now, when talking about lunar orbit, instead of perigee and apogee, the technically correct terms are perilune and apolune. Now, breaking down the name, near rectilinear refers to the parts of the orbit that are almost straight, or rectilinear, and halo refers to its use of the Earth-Moon Lagrange point. Now, there are several benefits of an NRHO, which is why NASA plans to use it for the Lunar Gateway. Now, an object in NRHO experiences near continuous sunlight, which is ideal for solar power generation. NRHO is also excellent for stable communications between the Earth and the Moon. Now, during the Apollo missions, for instance, the capsule experienced an up to 45 minute communication blackout with the Earth as it traveled around the dark side of the Moon. Now, due to its constant line of sight with the Earth and the Moon, an object in NRHO is able to maintain virtually constant communication with both. An NRHO also requires very little maintenance, meaning it's incredibly fuel efficient and doesn't need the sorts of orbital top-ups that, for instance, the ISS does, as we mentioned earlier in the video. An NRHO also gives excellent access to a lunar poles for landing, particularly the lunar south pole, making it an excellent choice as a staging point for Artemis lunar landings. Now, we've already covered some of the basics of highly elliptical orbits, but they deserve a little more detail on their own right. Now, HEOs, or highly elliptical orbits, as we already discussed, have elongated oval shapes, bringing satellites close to Earth on one end and far away on the other. Now, geostationary orbits, which we discussed earlier, only exist over the equator to maintain their geostationary position. 
Now, while this allows them to provide excellent coverage for the majority of the Earth, the poles are a bit of a black spot. Now, this is where HEOs come in. Now, satellites in HEO move slower when they're in their apogee, or the furthest point from the Earth. When the position of the apogee is placed over the poles, this allows them to sort of hover for extended periods over these areas. And this makes them ideal for communication and observation satellites in high latitude areas like northern Canada, Alaska, and Russia. When multiple satellites are placed into HEO over an area and the orbits are timed correctly, continuous coverage can relatively easily be achieved. As one satellite moves away, another comes in to take its place. Now, another benefit is the significantly lower energy requirement to place an object into HEO compared to GEO, meaning lower cost to get the object into orbit. Lagrange points, as we discussed earlier, are positions in space where the gravitational forces of two large bodies, like for instance the Earth and the Moon, balance the orbital motion of a smaller object. Now there are five Lagrange points between all celestial bodies. Now with big distance, it gets a bit more complicated. So for the purposes of this video, we're just gonna talk about objects in our solar system. So five Lagrange points between the Earth and the Moon, five Lagrange points between the Earth and Mars, five between the Earth and the Sun, etc., so on and so forth with all of the celestial bodies in our solar system. Now, when most people refer to L1 and L2, or Lagrange point one, Lagrange point two, they're talking about Lagrange points between the Earth and the Sun. So for instance, the JWST, or James Webb Space Telescope, is currently in L2, or more correctly, Sun-Earth Lagrange point two, approximately 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth. Now, the five Lagrange points between each two-body system, meaning two objects, do differ slightly. Now, L1, L2, and L3 are semi-stable points, where L4 and L5 are stable points. Now, although L1, L2, and L3 are only semi-stable, there are other factors to consider when deciding which Lagrange point to put your satellite. Now, taking the JWST as a great example, Though its L2 positioning is not as stable as L4 or L5, distance is another significant factor. Now, L4 and L5 are 150 million kilometers from the Earth, which is 100 times the distance compared to L2, making communication significantly more difficult, as well as drastically increasing latency, or the time it takes for the signal to get from the Earth to the satellite and back. Now, L2 also provides continuous line of sight to the Earth, meaning continuous communication is possible. Now, another important factor for the JWST specifically is the positioning in L2 allows it to keep its sun shield pointed continuously against the sun, Earth, and moon to maintain the ultra cool temperatures necessary for its very sensitive infrared measurements. Now, when we get to halo orbits, things start to get a lot more complex very quickly. For instance, to be technically correct, the JWST isn't just sitting in L2, it's in a three-dimensional, highly elliptical halo orbit around Sun-Earth L2. Now the simple version is, a halo orbit is a three-dimensional orbit around a Lagrange point, usually L1 or L2, in a stable periodic path. Now we all know they're of course called a halo orbit because they were first featured in the Halo video game franchise. No, I'm just joking. They're called that because their orbital isn't flat. It crosses over itself in a three-dimensional path like a cartoon halo. Now, I could honestly do a whole hour-long video on Lagrange points and halo orbits, but it would be really long and boring. So let's just leave it at the basics. I hope you now have a much better understanding of the basics of orbital mechanics. In reality, I've only really just scratched the surface. That's mission success for me. If you think I've missed something, gotten something wrong, or have something you'd like to add, please let me know in the comments. If you liked or found this video interesting, help me out by giving me a sub. I'd consider it a personal favor, which would put me in your debt, so there's that, but it also keeps me motivated to keep pumping out these videos. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.